I am absolutely delighted to have Richard Atherton, who is the podcast host of Being Human, uh, with me. And also, Richard is a transformation coach, and he's, he's been doing quite a lot of great work with teams, with organizations, and with humans, with people. The deeper work. You're listening to the Insight to Action Inspirational Insights podcast. My name is Donna Jones, and I'm your host. Richard, so nice to have you on the program today. Let's talk about the 115 some odd episodes I think you've just now released <laughs> with quite an eclectic. I mean, I just love the arc of, of, of your conversations. It's everywhere. So tell us some more about how that all began and what have you learned most from all of this? Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so how did it, well, it all began with Dave Snowden, who you and I both know, who's a complexity theorist and uh, yeah, developer of the, the now famous among certain circles, the Kinevin framework. And I had this idea, it was one of those sort of in the shower moments, you know, I'd really love to interview him and I'd love to do, and I know he's into walking, so I'd love to interview him in, in, his, in his natural habitat, right? Because he's always <laughs> tweeting photos of when he's out on the, in the hills. And, and so the, the plan was hatched and we ended up getting an ex-BBC film crew uh, to to we spent quite a lot of money on this interview uh, uh, with with guys who who, who really very good uh, camera crew and I I felt like God you know so, so, sort of so, somewhat overwhelmed by the crew that I had for me doing my effectively what became my first ever podcast recording with Dave Snowden but it was yeah out in the hills uh, asking him about his you know his perspectives on the world and and, and diving into his his theory around complexity and loved it and thought okay I, yeah i'm gonna start start uh, i want to do more of this and actually then hooked up with this big podcaster in the uk a guy called uh brian rose who uh has got a podcast called london real which is huge he's got sort of millions of millions of uh, followers and he runs this program where you can basically get coached by him for a period so i joined that and then i found myself doing weekly podcast as part of that program meanwhile this bbc crew are editing my dave snowden interview so that came out as sort of pub, pub podcast eight or nine even though it was the first one i recorded and in the meanwhile i was doing all these these conversations on zoom which which i was thoroughly enjoying yeah and now here we are i guess it's one of those things once i once i got into a routine I, I now I now feel guilty if I didn't produce one every week. It's like I have to produce one every week. It's become some kind of obligation to the universe that I create one every week. So, so it has been that I'm now yeah I'm well over a hundred. It's beautiful, and I mean because you're a transformation coach, and I look at some of the topics you've chosen. You know, I mean, mine being you know our conversation and one of your podcasts being one of them. But but beyond that, you know, the healing organization, complexity science just a real lovely romp. And I mean, my, my podcast was described as being eclectic and I look at yours and I go, yeah, that's, it's pretty darn close to that. It's, it's extremely, you know, it's got this lovely uh, diversity in it. So out of all the interviews you've done, like out of the 115 now that you've done, which ones, do you have any that really stand out? And I don't, I mean, they all do, I know that, but, but within the context of now, in the context of today's times, which ones kind of have are, are more present with you now than 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 before? Say, well, I guess the one that's that uh, I'm due to release this week is in terms of right now is by a, a guy called Robert Mayer, and he's the author of a book or co-author of the book called The Ostrich Paradox, and he looks at how our biases prevent us from preparing for disaster. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no more relevant a topic right now than. Uh, yeah, with our current situation and in the UK, and I'm sure other governments have been guilty, we did an exercise called the Cygnus, Cygnus exercise, I think 2008, yeah, a, a while back where we sort of, we, uh, 2018, where we like trial run the, the potential impact of a pandemic and then didn't take on a, some of the findings, at least some of the findings we didn't take on and we certainly didn't make it public. Uh, so this this inbuilt bias of ours to not take steps for our long term benefit uh, or by a set of biases, really a set of biases which all combine to have us be quite short termist in our approach to life and the way that we rationalize risk. Uh, yeah, really interesting conversation and just shed some light on 
why is we behave like we behave and and actually had me feel less animus towards the politicians because you know on this thesis they were simply being run by the same biases that we all have yeah absolutely i know i put that in decision making for dummies and i remember at the time realizing that knowing we have this 180 biases running underneath distorting data coming in and so forth the the requirement to really shift perspective and to be much more uh, thoughtful about decisions w- that are made, you know, y- you know, use the data points to make them better. It's really critical. And I'm kind of hoping that, that these kinds of things that happen will actually it, stimulate some insight into making that a better process overall. Yeah. And what he has in the second part of his book, which I love, is this idea of um, a, what's he call it? He calls it uh, a behavior, behavioral risk audit, behavioral risk audit, uh, where you actually proactively, when you're engaging in any kind of initiative, and this would apply for sort of a business initiative or a policy initiative at a government level, uh, to list the biases, um, the impacts that those that, that, that may pertain to this particular domain, the impact of those biases on our beliefs, beliefs, how those beliefs might manifest in behaviors, and then what you might do to remedy remedy that and i and i thought that is actually was a was a novel idea for me because i'd heard a lot about yes we've got these biases and we need to become more aware of them and that's kind of as far as it went but the idea that we could actually sort of build this into our management approaches our risk and here he's talking specifically about risk management approaches but i think in general in terms of how we set up initiatives uh, i think is a really powerful idea and lord knows how we attempt to have people take this on because of course it does run against the very biases it tends to to counteract but it did seem to me to be a a useful idea for us as a transformation coach how how have all of the not just that interview but how have all the other interviews changed or affected your work and what you do yeah i think some some of them tend to be more educational like like this you know i'm starting to actively think okay how could i perhaps introduce some of this to my clients other times it's just, I don't know, it just broadens the, the ideas of what might be possible as an intervention. Like one, one of my guys, the, the, one of my interviewees uh, is big into grounding, right? And the impacts of us being in connection with the earth yeah, we're, as, as we live. And he's, he's, he's sort of become his own test bed for these and for example he's sampled his bone density and he's i think he's in his 70s and his bone density is that of a sort of 30 year old because he goes everywhere bare feet right and he's walked across iceland bare feet and sort of (laughs) almost lost his you know lost half the skin off his feet and stuff so he's a lot of crazy stuff but he's also like thrown up this research research of um i think the media organization in i think it's japan where they had two floors of journalists and they had one set of journalists were all grounded and the other set of journalists were just how most of us are set up in our offices and and they saw a whole bunch of differences in terms of productivity and well-being and so on from the from the grounded journos so i'm like that is a brilliant idea why aren't more of us barefoot why aren't more of us grounded in our workstations how the fuck do i bring that as a transformation and <laughs> be like hey have you thought about like you know grounding people <laughs> yeah, so, exactly so sometimes it's like i can i can see the steps to like bringing it to my clients and other times i'm like man you know the universe has, has really got to align for um for the grounding conversation with my next client, you know? Well, especially when they're so allergic to things like soft skills, which are actually much more difficult to master than, um, than anything else, than, than just, you know, thinking, just, just following your distortions, following your biases. You know? <laughs> so, mm. yeah. In fact, the biases is maybe an easier one because it, yeah, it sort of has a harder feel to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's automatic. You don't have to, you know, yeah. you, don't have to, you don't have to pay attention to it and, and it can just run the show for you. <laughs> so, and then lead you down the, down the you know, very astray, you know, from a decision making point of view. Now, mm. I want to talk to you too about complexity because you because you've interviewed Dave, and you've also interviewed, uh, you know, you've interviewed a couple of different angles on complexity. Mm. What did you learn from those? Yeah, so I, I think um, so. The biggest, I suppose, the biggest difference in perspectives on complexity are probably re- yeah best characterized by the, de- the sort of the Dave Snowden view perspective and the and the Ralph Stacey or the Chris Malls perspective where. Um, so Chris Moores was a uh, was a guest on the show, but also a, a colleague of Ralph Stacey, and he critiqued Kenevin, which of course is the centerpiece of Dave's sort of worldview. 
in in the sense that the the sort of Stacy view is we can't. And I guess I'm feel like I'm sort of somewhat out of my depth even as I say this. Is that um, we can't we can't really think of anything touched by human hands as being any kind of an ordered system, right? So as soon as humans are involved, we have this, uh, this concept that he describes as transformative causality at play, which means as I'm, as it, you know, as I'm interacting with you, I'm having an, an impact on you that will affect the way that you interact with me, which is simultaneously affecting the way that I interact with you. So we're in this kind of entangled uh, interplay, which is entirely unpredictable. And this is the sort of nature of reality, this sort of mutual causality where, where I'm causing you and you're causing me co- simultaneously. And, it, and if that's the nature of reality, then can we really think in terms of an or any form of ordered system at all, right? <laughs> That that was that was where I got in terms of my mind with with that Stacy Stacian perspective, if you like, and then if we take that on, then well, maybe Kinevin really doesn't apply because actually we're in so there's some level of you know transformative causality occurring all the time, and then if we if we get to that point, we've sort of taken the message whole, yeah, wholesale that. Um, we, we really can't predict and the world really is uncertain. And, and then, and then what, right? Then, then it's, then it's a different context that we're in. And so I, I was, I felt somewhat disoriented by that conversation a bit, like almost like even now, as I say, it, I feel something nauseous. In fact, when I had this conversation with my partner, she said, stop talking. You're making me feel sick. <laughs> and, <laughs> you're spreading it. <laughs> and yeah, so I thought that that was really powerful then, because because then it gave me a counterpoint to Kinevin, because it, I guess because for so many of us, and I include myself in this, that the whole complexity field is kind of a bit um, impenetrable, really. And you, and and Kinevin was the first thing that sort of made sense and was coherent for me. This was then the first, I suppose, conversation that had me then look at it differently and think, well, maybe that's not the whole truth or the only way to look at it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. I mean, the interesting thing about these conversations is you're getting the different slices Mm. of information and each of them have a different perspective. Like, you know, when I listen to that, I know that I know, you know, the, the the kind of model is extremely uh, it's complex in itself in the sense that there's a lot of, a lot to know about it and how it works and how to actually work with it. But the aspect of what you just described with the more or less the entanglement, the quantum entanglement in conversation is, is another determining factor that, that overlays all of that, because that's the part about being human. That's the part that sort of says, we're in this moment. How are we each creating the, the experience of this period, you know, of this conversation and in this moment? So, yeah. Fascinating. And even, even so, so, and we, I described it there as a sort of human to human interplay, but if you took that by extension to sort of all entities, right? that there's this, there's this transformative causality occurring across all entities across time, then, right, then, then you're like, okay, uh, all right, so, so where is the order? Where, you know, what, do I, what, do I, what do I grasp onto here? What's, what's real? And, and pat- patterns may emerge, but they're going to constantly emerge in a way that we can't necessarily predict not complicated right that they are it's just it's always complex in that sense and i think that's exactly the moment we're in which is why that's a brilliant observation and 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 comment because it it really just says this is where we are and was where we're always going to be it's you know we've been sort of if you look if you think about it it's almost like we've been in a pretend world where we we tried to predict everything we try to control everything but in reality that's just not how what life is designed no that's right we uh yeah and then, yeah, and if you allow yourself to, it really is let go, right? You you let go, and allow allow yourself to have that be true for you. Then, yeah, then then it's a case of okay, well let let's take a kind of beginner's mind to the universe, right? Let's just be 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 in some state of reception for what's next, right? And 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 keep regenerating myself from that place. Okay, what's the you know what's the next thing to scan for? Where's the next pat? What's the next pattern that's emerging? What's the next? What's the next opportunity? Yeah. 
Yeah. Now let's bridge that over to organizations responding from COVID for a moment. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, because I'm hearing everything from claw back to the past, you know, bring back that certainty. Let's go back to the good. Even when, when Brexit came about in your country, you know, I was seeing comments about, we just want to go back to 1983. And the conversation I just had with uh, Dr. Tyson, uh, Yanka Porta, you know, he said, what is normal? I mean, in nothing, it, there is no real normalcy in the context of, of how the, the world where earth works you know how the planet itself works there's things are always dynamically changing so to go back into work and to begin to assume you're just going to reset everything back to before has a is problematic what are you observing there and what have you learned from your podcast that inform you know how people how being human can actually get better through the something like this through the experience everyone's shared yeah yes well I mean, I'll take, just take one example, actually, from a guy, a CEO who used to run a creative agency, right? He's now in a learning and development field. But one of the things that really frustrated him was he was always like trying to push his creative teams to go out and, uh, you know, get, get out of the office, basically, right? Get out, get into nature, go to museums, go, go find your muse out there. But, you, you know, we're not, we're not going to solve the problems, you know, in this, in this conference room, right? And, and, and COVID has kind of achieved that for him, right? All of his, you know, he's in a slightly different case, but they're all out, you know, walking in the woods and and uh, going to the beaches and, you know, that they're, that he, he's achieved getting them out of the office. And so where he's interested, he's like, okay, well, that's a most, so, okay, so now what? Now what? Now do I, how do I harness this? Okay, so maybe, and he's given up the lease on his central London office, the, the, the central London office. So he's kind of just, he's gone with it now. And, if you guys need to come together to collaborate in some way, what does that look like now? You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're hiring the local church hall for a week to do a design sprint, you know, for something you need to do, but it's sort of, it's, it's given him a, a completely new place to think from. And that's been just, I suppose the, the way that I'm reflecting on his approach is to be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to simply going to go with it and then see what's, what, what's next to emerge. What do we build on from here? And there's a novelty in that that I think is extremely refreshing. You know, it really mm. opens, it opens a lot of opportunities, a lot of different ways that one, you know, someone could get something done that doesn't go back to, you know, a square box in a, in a building where everybody has to show up from a specific period to the, to another period of time, assuming that, that you're able to be productive all that, you know, in, during that period, which is impossible. I mean, we're just not wired that way from any level. So what are you seeing in terms of, of how to rethink work and the future of work? And so this is kind yeah. of as you blend your podcast with your, with your professional experience. Yeah. And I'm suddenly thinking, Oh God, I should do more of this on my own podcast. I just get so, so into whatever <laughs> random topic it is. I sort of forget what my real job is. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> so there's definitely a new, there is going to be a new relationship between businesses and their physical space. I mean, I think that is clear, right? I mean, we've just shattered the assumption that that we need offices so you know what does that what does that allow for then you know what what does that mean for us what's going to emerge in that space uh, i think is is definitely a theme uh and then and then i said i said also think there's um this this question of the the light and the dark of work-life fusion right so that's been a thing for a while like you know forget trying to balance work and life you know just just how do we sort of approach i mean in some cultures right there's no there's no term for work right there is no distinction work it's just life and that's been an idea that's been rolling around in my you know what if there is no work it's just life you know right you you you, you intend for your day to be productive and to contribute to your community in some way and that's how you orient your life and that's that life and work in, in that sense become merged and we're seeing to maybe some sense of that right in this new these new arrangements where people are being productive with their families in different ways and then productive at work and then we're, we're seeing into the their lives as as parents or not as you know or whatever other commitments they might have uh, in their home life and and so that's another theme that's that i think is emerging and some people are tuning into is yeah what's what if we started to lose some of these distinctions maybe maybe we 
yeah, I'm thinking, and, and then that, but that becomes an identity challenge then, right? Because so many of us are hooked. I mean, you started with some labels that I might use as sort of props to my identity and my uh, transformation coach or something. Yeah. And so it's, is that's, so we, I suppose we're starting to get into questions of identity here when you start to get, you start to think about the idea of work life fusion. That's another, that's another sort of theme. And I'm not sure it's as sort of concrete as the office space piece where I think people are thinking much more in much more concrete terms like do I keep up my lease on this office or not right but this other question of work life identity I think is 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 a bit more nuanced and I think yeah but I my sense is that something is going to emerge in that space as well you know workplace health has been a big issue and and there's all the aspects of depression mental health etc etc in, in terms of going back, in terms of what you're seeing, you know, in terms of your conversation, what it takes to actually take things up a, a notch from where they were to a, a higher level of well-being, what are the opportunities that you're witnessing? Well, I, do, I think people are, are, are much more, you know, much more face-to-face with people, the reality of people's home life, right? And it has traditionally been our home lives where we've been much more open about our mental health and our well-being you know we've we've tended to be much more comfortable sharing that you know i'm struggling i've got depression with our family or our close friends and you know in around the home than we have been in the workplace we've kind of put on the you know the mask and the armor to you know to to, to waddle into the the cubicle in the morning uh, and i i think that's shifting a bit now so yeah as we as we get more of a sense of who people are in their home context we're getting warts at all right we're, we're getting more of a sense of where they might be suffering uh and so that that for me yeah is would be actually related to to what I, the theme i've just spoken about is that we're starting to see yeah a bit more of the reality of people's existence for good and bad and i hope that means that yeah that that starts to shift the conversation yeah around in in around mental health and well-being well, and one would hope it would hit the executive level where some of these decisions are being made that actually define the character of what, you know, of well-being in an organization. I was also just doing some research on which comp- countries uh, are the happiest. And it turns out they're also the most resilient and they're also the ones that do not suffer from trauma because when something hard hits, they they quickly rally and everybody works together to help one another. And those those countries are Finland, the, the Nordic countries generally, New Zealand there, there's there's some very distinct characteristics and I couldn't help but think when I read that that if you put you know if you lateral that over into the workplace really we're talking about setting the conditions for something very similar you know how using and I what did you learn from Raj Sasoda on that Sasodia? yeah well what I loved about so he he actually didn't talk about that so much sort of the the, the this this thought about resilience although that's a good one so i I suppose i got two main themes from rad one was this masculine feminine thing and i i've always for a while i mean i remember writing a blog article a while ago and and it was specifically focused on ctos right in the it department and i was calling for the feminization of the it department and how we needed to build more empathy into the into the management culture of uh, of of it teams especially and I, he he really did cause me a bit of a reframing of that because he he talked about this concept of healthy masculinity uh, and how it's really important for us to you know male and female to embody healthy masculinity right you know boundary setting and um, uh, goal setting and and having focus and many of the healthy masculine qualities but you know men and women also to embrace and in, and nurture our our healthy feminine right uh, yeah our nurturing capabilities and our ability to empathize and 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 actually he he talks about this sort of the he, healing leader as being somebody who embodies both a, the he, a healthy masculine and a healthy feminine and we bring both of both of those to the workplace both of those to our leadership both of those to our management and that for me actually was, was a very powerful idea that i took away took away from raj and then i suppose if you widen that out to the scope of the organization and then i suppose it then brings all of that to its community and so that's the idea then of the healing so as the healing leader brings that to their organization, the healing organization brings that to their community, right? They're providing 
uh, both in terms of masculine and feminine energy to their broader community. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, really what you're doing is creating a coherent space for wellness, which, yeah. you know, is very much in the, in just how you hold that space, what your focus is, what your decisions are, all of those things blend together. And I love, I love the feminists. I mean, to me, the fem, part of the femininity is reflection. Um, yeah. And that would have been, you know, should be, I hope the first stop coming back in is just reflect. What do we learn? What, what do we observe in ourselves? What are, how did our patterns change? What, which patterns do we want to let go of? Which patterns do we want to keep? So being very intentional about that and not just sort of getting back in and trying to be busy as a way to distract ourselves from what we just experienced. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there in that balance, in that dynamic or be understanding it better and just how to work with it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, Yes. And, and maybe, yeah, absolutely. And I think we've got, um, with all of these interruptions, I mean, that was the theme in our podcast, right? <laughs> with all of these on, uh, uh, interruptions. Yeah, you're right. We've, we, it's almost like we have a choice, right? What, what do we do with this interruption? Do we sort of go hard on and, and some new course based on having been interrupted uh, and sort of fully, fully give ourselves to, to the sort of the masculine? Or do we balance that with some time to reflect to go inwards to check in with what we're feeling as you say to to sense for what's emerging yeah absolutely now let's go back into your database of podcasts <laughs> which which over how long have you been doing it for now so yeah what are we, so it's a couple of years now just over a couple of years yeah and one a week yeah yeah you're way ahead of me you just brilliant work <laughs> and again an eclectic mix what guides you when you're choosing the the next program is it is it random is it more serendipitous is it a combination do you you know how do you know what to say yes to what to say no to or what to go for or not yeah um yes it's a it's a good question and i i suppose it's a little bit it's, it's mainly on intuition and personal interest i mean i think I have, because I haven't really attempted to commercialize it or even properly link it to my day job right i mean I, it has it's very much a labor of love which has yeah, meant that I have a lot of freedom. And it tends to be, you know, I'll read one book, I'll see the references, and then, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll think, oh, I should get those people on. I sometimes I get tips, people uh, call me, yeah, call me with stuff. Uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I sort of actively think about a theme or a topic and think, you know, what, what, what's a, a, a book or a speaker or somebody I could bring in who, who has an interest in that particular topic. Um, but it, yeah, it's all fairly emergent. I don't, I suppose I haven't, what I, I suppose what I'm not consciously aware of yet is a sort of set of harder guidelines or yes, no criteria for who I, who I bring on. One thing I the one thing that does personally drive me is because of my own experience with trauma recovery and I know that that topic can be kind of icky for a lot of people is like, that draws me to it all the more. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to bloody well, <laughs> you know, make you listen to this person who is going to talk about all of the, all of the, uh, the pain of their childhood. Right. Because, and there's part of me that feels like I just want to, I think we talked about it a bit on the uh, podcast is um, just, just broaden the Overton window a little bit, right. Of like what it's okay to talk about. Um, and so the, that's a, a particular interest, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't singularly drive me. Other, otherwise, I guess I'd have the, the trauma podcast or whatever. <laughs> It'd be yeah. a sole topic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's also, as we talked about it in, in the conversation we had, it's also about using trauma to, you know, bring, become more whole. It's really, it, yeah. it becomes the door. And, and really, we're not, we're also talking about that with respect to the period of time we're in, because the kind of responses people had were very much around not understanding what was going on. The trauma comes from not understanding what's happening, uh, having the, you know, the, the emotional experience of it be so harsh that it, it, it fractures. It's almost like a fracture of your energy, uh, you know, just, just who you are internally. So it's an opportunity to really go back and mend those fractures and, and work with them. And I think the organizations are in the same position. There's especially the ones that did the whole scale firing and, you know, just really didn't think but just let everybody just kind of did that knee jerk thing and just, Oh, we're going to, you know, we don't have enough money. Let's fire everybody. And, um, and, and because that obviously has some mid to long term consequences. Yeah. I think there is a lot of, a lot of that, but I also, I, I'm also starting to attempt in my mind to draw these threads of trauma recovery and complexity, you know, closer together because 
one of the things that we, we understand from complexity theory is that start, starting conditions are important, right? And so if, if we take the human as a complex system, the initial conditions that were formative on the complex system, the complex adaptive system emerging are, are important, right? And so if I think about that in my own context, what were, what were the, the initial conditions that I experienced in my birth and then, you know, and as in, in terms of my relationships with my mother and father. So I've, in a sense, gone back. And I think one of the things that we can do as human beings, which is to some extent difference between the difference with the world at large is that we can go back and to some extent modify the impact of those starting conditions on the organism is, is today. And for those of us willing to, to, to take the time and the effort to do that, I think it's possible I think it's less easy for organizations. I'm not even sure if I'm straining the metaphor too much and even if the sort of the logic transfers, but I also notice that if you look at some of these organizations that are, have the most healthy responses to perturbations, right? If you look at their starting conditions, how they were born, some of the print, I mean, look at Toyota, for example, right? And if you go back to the early manifesto, in terms of respect for people and what was sort of laid down as a blueprint for how that organization should operate. Yeah. It's, it's very apparent in the culture today. And then I take another example from my podcast, Henry Stewart and his uh, happy company and his book, happiness manifest when he started his company, it's the same, you know, he, he thought very clearly about what are going to be the operating principles and the, and if you like the starting conditions for life of this company and what, and, and now look at it today, but then if you look at other companies, you know, what were their starting conditions? Well, you know, maybe it was just, we're going to make money, right? We've got an opportunity in the market. We've got some investors. There's an opportunity for me to get rich and a few of my uh, shareholders to get rich. So that sort of bled through to the, co you know, the, the culture of the company. And that's, that's how it is today. So I think there's this interest I've got between how, how I can apply my own lessons of a sort of felt embodied experience of being a complex system that has emerged into something and looking across to, to, to so, so some apply some of that thinking to organizations my my mind has just gone in 10 different directions as you're describing that because we're both facilitators we've both worked in tough situations and i think there's a there you know just understanding what the role of trauma in i, I remember working for a nonprofit where i'd gone in and and it, it was a the working role people were so hard on each other I mean, really hard. The executive director just committed fraud and had uh, basically stolen all of the money that was being you know, these people would be paid for. So they hadn't been paid for months um, and, and the money to pay them was gone. And then when I traced, when I started working with, and they want to do a strategic planning, which was code for, we don't want to be where we are anymore, but <laughs> we want to be somewhere else. And as we got into it, you discovered that, well, obviously you discovered this wound, you know, that was sitting there that, that had just been glossed over. It, it's almost like that we have this habit of wanting to pretend perfection. You know, let's not talk about these harder things because if we just pretend they don't exist, we can keep going. And meanwhile, it just serves as an undertow on the whole opportunity that any, any organization has, nonprofit, profit, it really doesn't matter. And then when I went back into this organization's history, it turned out there'd been I think, one murder and, and there was something else, it was just, it was crazy. So, you know, in, in those situations, you're not only healing or not only healing, and what I'm saying is you're not only addressing that part of the wound, but you're also addressing if they're in the same location. And this work has been done by, you know, the HeartMath Institute has, has documented this. You're also working with the, how the space is holding those energies as well. So, right. you know, it was really an interesting, we did every, you know, I mean, in terms of the, my, my work with the client, the client did their own thing, but together they brought in theater companies to kind of act it out and think it through and, and, and just where people would sabotage themselves, where they would sabotage the group and, and just how that came up and wow. So, it, I mean, that's a real extreme case, you know, obviously super, super extreme, but it still is the, you know, it's a training ground for understanding when we see go into a new organization, what's going on, you know, <laughs> coming out of COVID, what's happening here, where have we taken the wounds of our experience and brought them into the organization, where are we suppressing them, that's going to turn into mental health issues right off the top. 
So there's just, you know, it, it, it's in order to become a whole being, you know, like a high performance organization with a coherence around it, I don't think we can avoid those kinds of conversations. I think those are the conversations that actually create uh, the opening for us to become better, not just as humans, but also organizationally. Any, does that make any sense at all to you? Yeah, I think, I think, I think that makes complete sense. Yeah, we do need to talk about it. You know, I remember I went into an organization and they, they'd had a, not quite the same, but they'd had a big failure of a big waterfall IT transformation where they'd kind of, they'd, they'd been sold a pup by this outside vendor in terms of what they were going to do for them. Uh, they ended up suing the vendor because the, it was all sort of vaporware from the vendor and there was a, yeah, there was a lot of trauma around all of that. And when we came in to do a restart of this transformation, they didn't want to talk about this other project, right? It was just like, you know, it was the, you know, the Scottish play, right? We're not, we're not going to talk. We're not, we, that, that, that shall not be named. And we did, as I now reflect on it, deal with some level of grief around it uh, by virtue of the fact that we started to put publicly, one of the things that one of the principles, the starting conditions for this particular transformation, well, let's be public about it, right? Let's, let's work out loud let's let's visualize the whole of what we're doing and let's make it public and so we started to put public boards up telling the start you know these are our plans this is what's in progress this is what we've done already so we put like these public kanbans up and boards up these are the team members this is the mission this is the vision and we and initially we just got this huge amount of abuse on this board right people were like every evening people would write abuse you know effing this and effing that and you a fucking consultant son you're all clones and it's you know and and as i now look at it what we were doing is we were allowing for a little bit of grief right we were allowing for yeah. some of the anger to come out of the organization about what happened previously and their previous experiences of changed initiatives and so on and so i think what we were doing even though we weren't naming this experience and in, in, in any way sort of public acknowledging it what we were doing was we were certainly allowing for a lot of the uh, emotions around those prior experiences to come out and certainly we were in the same building. So, you know, if the walls are somehow <laughs> affected by it, then, then we were, uh, yeah, we were in the same space and we were much more public in terms of public demos. And so we, we provided tons of opportunity for people to, to vent. Uh, and that may have made a big difference in, uh, in our success actually. Yeah. It does make a big difference. I've had that. I've seen that repeatedly in the, in the, you know, 20, 30 years of my facilitation work. Every time they try to pretend perfection, they, they, they just make, they're kind of just playing around the surface. They're not really setting any roots into the ground and taking off. They're just playing around. And so when you actually can put those issues on the table, work them through, oh, it's so much smoother. It's so much easier. And, and I, I can relate to what you went through because, it, you know, it, it went one way or the other, whether it's accidentally or intentionally, to have that place where people can just express themselves, even though you might get beaten up in the process, at least they're, you know, it's, it's like Shrek, I used to say, it's like Shrek in the first, movie, you know, animated Shrek movie. It's like better out than in, you know, <laughs> get it out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, then we can work with it. Can't and my sponsor it. at the time was like, Richard, we should take this thing down, get it away. And I was like, no, 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 keep it up, keep it up. Yeah. Let them, let them vent, let them, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it was the right decision. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I would absolutely agree for sure. Where do you see yourself going with all this? This is kind of a personal pop it on you question. <laughs> I yeah, mean, you've well, got 115 podcasts, you've got your career and the work you've been doing to help, you know, help companies and, and leaders uh, shift their stance in their work. What, what do you see ahead for you? Yeah, I, I think, what do I see ahead? I jokingly said, somebody said to me recently, when are you going to stop? I said, well, when I've got to a thousand, I've done a hundred. So maybe when I've got to a thousand and <laughs> they were like, do you realize that's uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, a few decades or something. Uh, so I, I, um, yeah, I, I'm going to keep going. I mean, I'm enjoying it. I mean, I really probably should try and work out how, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to have to work out one way or another how to, to make it, um, have it be sustainable financially which I haven't put a lot of focus into much focus into so far. Um, so, and, and to continue to, but I do see it as a, a craft skill, right? I, I sort of subscribe to the 10,000 hours. I do, I do think you've got to, 
I'm building my skills as an interviewer and as a conversationalist and I want to, and I'm really enjoying that process actually of becoming better at it, I hope, <laughs> and practicing it. So I, I, I think that I suppose a desire for mastery in holding rich conversations that people find valuable deep conversations where I can, you know, that's part of it is what's the level of depth I can get to with guests. How can I make it exciting, entertaining, right? All of these questions I'm always asking, like, how can I develop all of those skills and have that outcome for my audience? That's something I'm, I'm now becoming much more interested in developing as I grow before it was just about, can I, can I do this? Right. Can I, can I, can I develop a rhythm? And now I guess it's much personally, much more motivated about mastery. And then, getting it out to as many people as possible. I, I know myself, having been podcasting for 12 years, and I, I have just a few more than what you've done, but I mean, some of the work I did was on pretty difficult conditions. But at the same time, w what I appreciate what you just said is, is it, it is about the rich conversations. And, and Marsha Shank, who does the ecosystem intelligence work, is what is this conversation? What is, so being conscious of, is it rich? Is it depleting? What is, and I think, even just, you know, through your work in the podcast, even just bringing an awareness of what a rich conversation sounds like is enormously helpful for organizations that aren't having them and need to be having them, especially now when we're doing a bit of a reset or we've got the chance to do a reset and not just a reset, but to take it up a level, a quantum level, not just one of these long, slow, excruciatingly incremental processes, but jump make a big jump. You know, rich conversations are an essential quality, an essential part of that. So I, I love what you're doing. And I really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate the diversity of it and the way you work and the way you flow. So it's, uh, I think, you know, there's, there's a leadership role you're playing, whether you're aware of it or not, that has to do, you know, that can really help organizations be, become more aware of what is, what are we doing in our conversations? Uh, you know, because I, yeah. I also think that the whole business of telling people what to do is over. I think you can set goals together, uh, but I don't think telling them what to do is just like, what's the point of that? You, you hired really talented people. and Now you're telling them how to get their job done. It, you know, it, if you're in a certain condition where there's high risk and there's steps and methodology and all of that, fine. But, you know, that's even that's going to wear out over time. So the, the autonomy has never been more important. Mm. The need for autonomy. Yeah, the need for autonomy. And yeah, it's a, it's a good point you make. Like even, yeah, the, the skill of conversation. I mean, that's interesting in itself, right? I mean, do, one of my po recent podcast guests was, was lamenting the, the death. Yeah, the, 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 the conversation skills. Yeah. Because of uh, our addiction, our technology addictions. And we're becoming anxious, right? The, the, this almost become a millennial meme, right? You know, anxious of picking up the telephone. Yeah, he, he he talks about you know, and his his all his sort of initiative is called Offline. It's the title of the podcast. Off Get Offline is how can we bring back conversation? How can we venerate conversation? How can we enjoy conversation for its for its own sake? Uh, and what does that give us, especially in an organisational con context? And I think that's something we may have a lot. And I'm definitely hearing about that. We talked earlier about what what are you what are you sensing from my conversations? One is yeah, we've somehow lost the the spontaneous conversation, you know, the long lunch, the, yeah, the, the, the serendipitous conversation in the office, uh, everything has to be scheduled, right? Everything's a Microsoft, Microsoft Outlook invite or equivalent uh, with a Zoom call and, you know, an appointed time. So, yeah, I think that's something that people are missing. I'm, uh, well, and, we, and even going back, I mean, we're starting to see coverage of that now The people are going for, for the social, for the social collaboration, and is there an opportunity for those rich conversations to take place? To, to what extent are we, is that being nurtured as a part of it? Or is it, let's just get back and get things done. Let's get busy again, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so again, it's a moment where we have to just sort of, and I saw you had one of the episodes was on conversational intelligence, where the quality of the conversations, Judith Glazer's original work, mm. quality of the conversations determines the quality of the, of the culture, really. I mean, there's the capacity of the culture to tackle the tough stuff that, you know, the degree of trust and, and all of that. So I, you know, I think that, that um, you're onto something with this. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I think, and, and even if you, if you view life as our lives as individuals, you can just view it as a series of conversations that we yeah. choose to have, right? Yeah. <laughs> or that we yeah. find ourselves having. And is it, what's an organization, if not just a collection of conversations, right? I mean, that's yeah. another way of looking at it. So yeah. 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 And it's about relationships and connection. I mean, that, that is the deepest part of it. So, 
Yeah. yeah. Richard, thank you very much for joining me and just having a fun conversation. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. I certainly have. Anything you want to add? No, I, well, I suppose I should certainly, I should thank you on behalf of, a, of um, several audience members who emailed me after our conversation to say that you provided something when you, you shared so generously about you know, your darker moments and how you emerged from them. So, I, yeah, I thank you again for that. I think oh, that was wonderful. My something. pleasure. It's funny because, you know, for years you don't talk about anything like that because there's a, people assume shame or they assume, I, I'm noticing this in certain contexts that I go in. In fact, no, this is interesting. It's almost like you're not, you're invisible. Um, but in reality, if we're not out there with, if we haven't, first of all, dealt with it ourselves, which is the opportunity, we can't have those conversations. We have to be able to have them because there's been, there is a lot going on and not every, you know, we're not all e always a hundred percent equipped to deal with it. So it's, it's a lot easier just to recognize that and then become a better, you know, better equipped. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. All right. You can find Richard's podcast both on YouTube and uh, if, would you want to just name the places? You yeah. Can... So it's on, it's, it's on YouTube. It's on, it's now on Spotify. Actually, we've just got it onto Spotify. Yes. With, uh, so it's on iTunes. We're all happy about that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the URL is easy. I mean, the name of the podcast is being human, but uh, it's created out of uh, our company, which is called first human. So the URL is first human spelt out f-i-r-s-t human.com slash podcast uh, and the easiest way to find it yeah and professionally richard's site is richardatherton.com i believe uh, no so i i mean i main i mean i do have a, a personal website richardatherton.net although i don't particularly use it i mean all of my work now i do through the first human partnership and you can find that at first human again, spelt out at F I R S T first human.com. Yeah. Where we, uh, we coach executives, we coach business teams. Uh, uh, we do a lot of work in leadership development and we also take on specific performance challenges or issues that, that, uh, that companies have and we'll intervene to, uh, to coach and guide them through whatever difficulty they might be facing. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It's been a pleasure. As always. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> you Thank too. You. Thank you. I'm Donna Jones. I provide personal growth for business, mentoring leaders and decision makers who are really ready to adapt their awareness and inner skill set to both meet and match the complexity and speed of change. I also bring intuitive insight into decision making and leadership expansion so that collaboration can benefit from conflicting perspectives and higher trust. By embedding a healthy balance between certainty and uncertainty, growth at a personal and organizational level has a serious chance. Contact me through LinkedIn or through www.fromInsight2Action.com. And it's Donna, D-A-W-N-A.